Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for being here. My name is Skip Rutherford. I'm Dean of the Clinton School, and we welcome you to another in a series of public programs. I want to thank our volunteers who make these programs possible, along with the great work of Nikolai DePippa, whose uh, speaker series, I believe, is second to none. So we, uh, we, we thank you all for coming tonight on a subject of great interest to Arkansas, um, regardless of what side you are on this particular issue or whether you're just smack dab in the middle, uh, it is a topic of major importance uh, to our state. To uh, introduce our speaker, and could I ask please if you'd turn your cell phones and other electronic devices off, they interfere with our cameras. Um, to introduce our speaker uh, this evening is Clinton School student Angela Toomer. She's from Little Rock. She's a graduate of Christian Brothers University in Memphis, where she majored in English for corporate communications, and she minored in women's studies. She served with AmeriCorps in Oakland, California, and Providence, Rhode Island. And right now at the Clinton School, she's working on activities related to the 12th Street Health and Wellness Clinic in our city. Please welcome Clinton School student, Angela Toomer. Thank you, Dean. So to begin this introduction, I would just like to share with you all some interesting facts about Alex um, that don't really have anything to do with fracking, just because he's led a really interesting life, and I think you should know about that. Um, so Alex worked as a fisherman in Australia and as a, as a janitor in Paris, and he's had numerous other random odd jobs around the world. He planned to spend three months traveling that turned into two years traveling around the world, and he wrote in journals along the way, which is um, how he became a writer. Um, the second fact is he created a character who would become the Seinfeld soup Nazi in a place called Slave, or in a piece called Slave. Um, and he's also written for other uh, publications including Time, Business Month, and Vanity Fair. Um, Julia Child is our speaker's great aunt. Um, he co-wrote with her her memoir, My Life in France, but he's also authored five other books, um, and he was on The Daily Show recently talking about one of these books. So now to get into what our speaker is actually here to talk about, hydrofracking. Um, it's constantly in the news, very controversial topic, um, lots of people on either side of the debate. Um, today, 90% 90 90 of our natural gas wells use fracking, um, which is a practice that fractures rock with pressurized fluid to extract natural gas and oil. It's a very effective process. Um, but it's been criticized for polluting uh, land, air, and water, and for endangering human health. Um, so what, what Prudhomme does is he offers an accessible take on the issue, and he explores both sides of the debate fully, um, tries to stay away from any like, scientific jargon, makes it a pretty accessible um, piece so that people can understand it. Um, so he talks about the benefits, and he talks about the potential negatives. So without further ado, to explain more about um, hydrofracking is Alex Prudhomme. Thanks, Angela. And thank you to the Clinton School, and thank you all for coming tonight. This is a great crowd. Um, I'm glad to see that people are engaged, because this is a, a subject of the day. Um, I wrote a book a couple of years ago about fresh water called The Ripple Effect, and in the process of doing that book, I became aware of hydrofracking. And in fact, I can pinpoint the moment. <clears throat> it was November of 2009 uh, when I attended the first and so far the only public meeting in New York City about hydrofracking. It was a cold and blustery night in downtown Manhattan, and over a thousand people jammed into an auditorium in a high school. Uh, to learn about the potential benefits and hazards of this thing that we've been hearing about, fracking. Um, now, New York City gets its water from this vast watershed um, over 100 miles away from the city that the city has carefully put together over the years and carefully protected. Um, it happens that that watershed sits on top of something called the Marcellus Shale. The Marcellus is a 95,000 square mile deposit of gas-rich rock that stretches from New York State to Pennsylvania, Ohio, Maryland, and down to West Virginia. And the stakes in play there are enormous. 
The Marcellus is thought to be the single largest energy deposit in the United States and the second largest natural gas deposit in the world. It contains at least 500 trillion cubic feet of natural gas, which is enough to power all American homes for 50 years. So far, only a small part of that shale formation has been fracked, mostly in Pennsylvania. And the question that night was, do we frack in New York? And if so, how and where? At that point in 2009, fracking was making headlines. Um, I knew that it had created jobs, spurred industry, and was uh, lowering emissions. But I also heard the critics saying that they were very worried about how it was impacting land, air, and water, and human health. And the critics were saying that the costs outweigh the benefits. And so uh, I was intrigued as a guy working on water about uh, what, those, what those impacts might be. So I'm not a geologist. I'm not uh, an energy analyst. I'm not an environmental professional. I'm a writer. My job is to go out and observe and report. Um, my book, The Ripple Effect, was growing larger and larger because I realized that water um, is becoming the defining resource of this century. But I was also at that meeting for a more personal reason. I'm a native New Yorker. Uh, my family and I and almost nine million other people use that water every day. And I wanted to know how fracking would potentially impact the water that we drink. So the crowd that night was large, it was energized. Uh, about half the people there were anti-frackers. Um, about a quarter were pro-frackers, and about another quarter hadn't made up their minds yet. Some people were dressed in suits or high heels. Other people had camouflage or muddy blue jeans on. Some people were dressed as mountains or streams and were carrying signs. <laughs> There were a few guys in camo in the corner, rural New Yorkers, who were defiant about their ability to work in the gas fields or lease their property to the frackers. Um, there were city slickers next to me who were uh, very concerned about how this industrial process would impact their land values at their country house. And there were other people very concerned about uh, the water and the air. And the rhetoric, as the night went on, grew increasingly uh, polarized. On the one side, the pro-frackers were saying, you know, you can get rich or you can stay poor. While the opponents on the other side were saying, well, you know, the choice is really between clean wells or flaming tap water. Now, neither of those statements is really accurate, and they both vastly oversimplify a very complicated set of issues. At the end of the night, I was walking out and I happened to be talking to a professional woman with a couple of kids, and she said, you know, I came here looking for answers, but now I'm more confused than ever. Is fracking good or is it bad? And I said, well, you know, you could be speaking for most of the American public right now. Uh, the fact is, a lot of us have heard about fracking, but we don't really understand what it is, and we can't really decide, once we do know what it is, how we feel about it. Um, there are no national statistics on this, but in, in New York, people are almost evenly split. 39% are in favor and 43% are against fracking. Some people call it the energy revolution or the shale gale, while others refer to an environmental disaster and fear a global frack down. The Wall Street Journal says that uh, hydrofracking is a matter of economic life or death, while uh, people like Yoko Ono and the actor Mark Ruffalo note that if New York's watershed is polluted, the city will have to build a $10 billion filtration plant. So for the moment, New York has put a moratorium on fracking while we uh, conduct several new environmental studies. Um, and there are frustrated drillers like Chesapeake en Energy that have given up their leases uh, in the Marcellus. And uh, Governor Cuomo, who has presidential ambitions, uh, treats the Marcellus discussion like a third rail. In other words, uh, it's politically toxic to him. Whatever he decides, he'll face terrible blowback. Um, and I'm telling you this story about the argument in my backyard because it mirrors what's going on here to a certain extent and nationwide and indeed globally as fracking spreads. Um, I've seen it split regions, states, communities, families, and even some couples that I know. Um, Hydrofracking is a classic disruptive technology. 
It's redefining the way that we think about energy and use it. And it's one of the most critical economic and environmental issues of our day. And so therefore, it's something that we all have a stake in, whether we like it or not. And indeed, it's worth talking about and arguing over. But as the crowd in New York demonstrated that night, there is a lack of basic information and hard data, and there's an excess of hyperbole and confusion. So in light of this, I thought, well, this would be a good time to, uh, to write a balanced and dispassionate primer on hydrofracking. Explain what it is, how it's conducted, where, why, um, the pros and cons of fracking, and its possible future. Uh, so I've written this short book, which we have over here, and I'd be happy to sign later for you, um, uh, called Hydro Hydrofracking, What Everyone Needs to Know. So let's start at the beginning. What is hydrofracking? Well, even on this very simple, basic question, people disagree. Um, the word means different things to different people, but to the public, fracking has become a catch-all phrase that describes two processes. The first is the drilling of a well, and the second is the actual hydrofracking, which is the um, injection of water and chemicals underground to extract oil and gas. So how does it actually work? Well, it's a multi-stage process. Imagine you're standing in a field in California, or Colorado, or North Dakota, or right here in Arkansas. It's quiet. You hear the wind blowing through the grass. But in front of you is a tall derrick, four stories tall. Um, you hear a clanking noise. And the roughnecks on the rig in their orange hard hats are lowering a diamond-tipped drill bit to the ground. And with a loud shriek and clouds of dust, they begin to, draw, to drill a borehole. And they drill down and down a half a mile or a mile, maybe more. And then they turn the bit horizontally, and they continue to drill uh, laterally another half a mile or a mile or longer. Uh, the technology is quite extraordinary. Once they've drilled their well, they, they, um, they send down um, a steel casing to line the borehole, and then they send a package of, of explosives to the very end of the, of the borehole, and they detonate it, which perforates the very end of the borehole. And then up at the surface, some giant pumps rev up, and they start to push a million gallons or more of water that's been mixed with chemicals and sand uh, into a slurry. And they pump that at extreme pressure, 9,000 pounds per square inch, which could easily strip the paint off of a car. And when that pressurized slurry hits the bottom of the well in those little perforations, it shoots out into the rock with the, ex with the explosive power of a bomb. And it fractures the shale. And the sand in the slurry, which is called propant, props open those fractures, which allows the gas or the oil to flow up to the surface uh, where it's collected. Um, so this is hydrofracking in a nutshell. Um, it's not a gentle process, but it is very, very effective. And under the right circumstances, five or 10 or even 20 wells can emanate from a single drill pad. And uh, most wells are fracked multiple times, anywhere from 10 to 30 stages. It's interesting because geologists have known about this shale resources for years, really been since the 1860s. But those resources were considered too deep and uh, the rock too hard and too difficult and expensive to access. Fracking was first used in Kansas in 1947 in a rudimentary way. It wasn't very efficient, it wasn't very cost effective, but the engineers kept tinkering with it for decades. And finally, a guy named George Phidias Mitchell came along. He was the son of a Greek goat herder, and he had become a wildcatter in Texas in the Barnett Shale. And he made this key breakthrough. He developed something called slick water fracturing, in which a cocktail of chemicals uh, is uh, included with the water slurry. It scours out the borehole, and it helps to increase the flow of the, of the gas and, and the water. It took him 17 years and $6 million of his own money to develop this process, and many people were happy to tell him uh, that he was wasting his time. But he kept at it, and in 1998, his innovation changed everything. So now, a well that once produced 70 barrels of oil a day and cost $300,000 to frack could produce 700 barrels of oil a day for only $100,000. 
So this mailed, made shale formations uh, economical for the first time and turned Mitchell into a billionaire. Um, these resource-rich rock formations that we talk about are called shale plays, and they stretch across the country in, in kind of pockets. Um, you have the Monterey Shale in California. You have the Bakken in North Dakota. Here in Arkansas, you have the Fayetteville Shale. Um, at the moment, fracking is only commercialized here in the U.S. and in Canada. But there are many other nations that are watching us, and they want a piece of the action. Western Europe alone has some 639 trillion cubic feet of shale gas. That's more than four times what we have in the Marcellus. And there are large deposits in Australia, Russia, Mexico, and even in South Africa. In fact, the US has only the fourth largest shale deposit in the world, after China, Argentina, and Algeria. Think about those names. And think about a future where those nations are the new Saudi Arabia, and you begin to understand the enormous potential impact of hydrofracking. Yet, as hydrofracking has spread, so has the opposition to it. Critics from Pennsylvania to Poland have blocked drilling sites. German beer brewers and California wineries worry about how fracking will impact their water supplies. Towns in Colorado, Michigan, and England have called for a moratorium. And states like Vermont and New Jersey have joined nations like France and Bulgaria in banning it altogether. So this brings me to the dialectical part of the evening where I ask, what is it about hydrofracking that makes people love it or hate it so passionately? Excuse me. <clears throat> well, let's start with some of the positives. The economic consensus holds that fracking creates jobs, revenue, and new energy supplies. The scientific consensus holds that natural gas burns more cleanly than coal. And the political consensus holds that cheap natural gas could make America energy independent for the first time and help us transition to cleaner and greener fuels. So I'll briefly parse this. The economic impact has been remarkable. Shale energy currently supports 600,000 jobs, and President Obama thinks that that could double by 2030. A state like Pennsylvania, which has long imported gas, is now exporting gas. Prices have dropped dramatically. Five years ago, shale gas cost $13.68 per million BTU. But with the fracking boom combined with the recession, prices fell 60%. After dipping below $2 last year, prices doubled to $4.04 per MBTU this year and are expected to go slightly higher next. But at those prices, many frackers are not making any money, even though they are contractually obliged to keep drilling under use it or lose it contracts. So cheap, cheap gas may be bad for some frackers, but it's been great for industry. Uh, industry uses around a third of US gas supplies. And the shale gale has had a huge impact on trucking and high tech, glass, steel, and even the making of plastic toys. Petrochemicals are used to make fertilizers, and a company like Dow Chemical, which you, uh, moved uh, some of its facilities abroad a decade ago, searching for cheaper fuel, has now started to reshore those facilities and is even building new ones here. As for the science, well, coal emits twice the CO2 that natural gas does, and it sends toxic metals like mercury into the air, and coal mining is more dangerous and environmentally destructive than hydrofracking. So while Europe and China and India are increasingly reliant on cheap and plentiful coal, the US is going in the opposite direction. Here, cheap gas is supplanting coal. As a result, energy-related emissions were down 3.8% last year, the lowest they've been since 1994, and 12% lower than their peak in 2007. Finally, we come to the political consensus. Now, we Americans love to drive our cars, uh, cars use about 70% of the oil uh, that we use and produce about 30% of our greenhouse gases. And for many decades, we've imported our oil from the Middle East. OPEC nations control 40% of the oil of the, of the world and have long held tremendous leverage over the prices at our pump. Um, and we learned the hard way in the 1973 oil embargo um, how that works. But hydrofracking is changing that. The U.S. oil production could expand to 15 million barrels a day by 2020, more than double the current rate. 
This would lower domestic oil prices and turn the U.S. into an energy exporter. It would reduce OPEC's influence on our pump. It would limit our exposure to Middle Eastern conflicts. And it would allow us to achieve the long-sought goal of energy independence. It's even possible that we'll all be driving compressed natural gas cars in a few years uh, that are supplied by a pipe that comes right out of our home. You know, the natural gas supplies our stoves. You could have a pipe that comes right into the garage. But the great promise of natural gas is that it will be a so-called bridge fuel that will help us to transition from dirty fossil fuels like oil and coal to cleaner renewables like hydro, uh, wind, and solar. So to the energy industry, hydrofracking and the shale gale, it's all good news. And some people predict that over a million new wells will be hydrofracked around the world by 2035. At the same time, environmentalists are increasingly worried about the impact that fracking has on air, water, and our health. And they believe that the pell-mell rush into fracking, before we really understand its true impact, puts short-term profit ahead of long-term safety and is unacceptably risky. As the anti-fracking sentiment grows, celebrities have embraced it. The Rolling Stones wail against it in a song. A documentary Gasland, which I think some of you saw recently here, uh, has generated headlines. Uh, Matt Damon has made the feature film Promised Land. My personal favorite is David Letterman, who likes to rant that greedy energy companies and a lazy EPA have left the public vulnerable to flaming wells and maybe even exploding toilets. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, he says, we're screwed. Well, Dave, how exactly does fracking screw us? Let's take a look at the negatives. The most contentious aspect of hydrofracking is contained in its name. It uses a lot of water. It uses 70 to 140 billion gallons of water to frack 35,000 wells every year. That represents about a million and a half to five millions of gallons of water per year per well. And some wells use a lot more, up to 13 million gallons per year. This has already set off so-called water wars in arid places like Colorado and California and Texas. But imagine when fracking spreads to arid nations like India and China and Australia, where right now there's a terrible drought and wildfire. And there's a growing population. So to put those numbers into perspective, the energy industry likes to say, well, fracking uses about three-tenths of a percent of the total US fresh water consumed. Golf courses actually use slightly more, five-tenths of a percent. And agriculture uses 243 times more water than hydrofracking does. Furthermore, hydrofracked gas uses 60% less water than coal and 75% less water than nuclear power. Now, from my perspective, this isn't to say that water use by hydrofrackers is not important, because it is. But the point is the growing importance of water uh, in general. It's a commercial and a strategic resource, and it happens to be necessary for survival. So we ignore it at our peril. This brings us to wastewater, water pollution, something that maybe you all are interested in because this has been a real issue here in Arkansas. So you've probably heard about the flaming tap water that Josh Fox had in Gasland, and this is the result of methane leaking into people's wells. Uh, this is obviously a concern, but it remains unclear if those gas leaks actually come from fracking or if they're uh, the result of natural geology and seepage. In parts of Colorado and Pennsylvania, gas has infiltrated water wells for years, and setting your tap on fire is an old parlor trick. So the EPA is studying this issue, and it'll be very interesting to see what they find. But there are other more obvious concerns uh, about the contamination. Take the fracking chemicals. As you may have heard, uh, the drillers are allowed to keep the identity of some of their chemicals secret. This is the result of the 2005 energy bill, <clears throat> also known as the Halliburton loophole, so named because it was the brainchild of former Halliburton CEO and Vice President Dick Cheney. Now this bill provides a special exemption to frackers from the Clean Water Act, and it limits the ability of the EPA to regulate which chemicals they use. So the rationale for this exemption is that it protects trade secrets and promotes innovation. Now, in the back of my book, I have a list of about 55 chemicals that the frackers use. 
And that list comes from the industry. But according to a congressional study, which you can get online, the drillers actually use a lot more chemicals, something like 2,500 different chemicals. Now, some drillers just use a few of these. Uh, other drillers use many of them. Um, each cocktail is different, and it's tailored to the individual geologic conditions of the well. Most of those chemicals are benign. They include things like sodium chloride, which is in table salt, or borate salts, which are in cosmetics, or guar gum, which is used to make ice cream. But others, like benzene, which is a carcinogen, the solvent 2BE, or hydrochloric acid, which can actually dissolve rock, are toxic and are anything but benign. The energy industry says that states provide sufficient oversight and that we really don't need any federal regulations of fracking chemicals. But some states, like California, have very minimal fracking rules, and others, like Kentucky, have none at all. So as a result, the public really has no idea what's being pumped underground. And for every one million gallons of fracking fluid, uh, includes 10,000 gallons of chemicals. And though the hazardous compounds in that mix are a tiny percentage, the toxicity of some of those chemicals is measured in the parts per million. So the translation is a little bit of poison can go a long way. So the big worry is that it's very difficult to control uh, the size and direction of fractures deep underground. And once the shale is fracked, you really can't unfrack it. So even though the shale formations lie far below the water table, it is possible for chemicals to migrate into groundwater supplies. Now, aquifers flow for many miles underground, often in unpredictable ways. And if polluted, they can be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to clean up. The public doesn't like the Halliburton loophole, and even some people in the industry, like the former Shell and Chesapeake Energy executives, who once compared their fracking formulas to the secret recipe of Coca-Cola, have said the industry needs more transparency in order to win over the public. Then there are the billions of gallons of fracking wastewater produced every year. This is a murky liquid that's thick with chemicals and propants and salts, and sometimes low levels of naturally occurring radioactive material like radon and uranium that's dredged up from underground by those powerful pumps. Most wastewater across the country is disposed of by pumping it into injection wells, as is the case here in Arkansas. On rare occasions, that wastewater has hit a geological fault zone and caused an earthquake. Uh, this has happened here, it's happened in Ohio, it's happened in Colorado. Most of these were minor quakes. Uh, one researcher described it as the impact, uh, comparable to the impact of dropping a book off of a ladder. You could barely feel it. But there have been a few that have been a little more significant. And in fact, there was one in Oklahoma that produced a magnitude 5.7 quake that destroyed 14 homes, dam damaged 200 other buildings, and was felt across 17 states. Now, uh, in the Northeast, where I'm from, the geology is too complex to have injection wells, and we, we uh, get rid of our wastewater by sending it through pipelines or by truckload to wastewater treatment plants. Uh, the problem with that is twofold. First of all, you can have truck accidents and uh, damage to highways and spills. And second of all, most of those treatment plants aren't equipped to deal with these uh, salts and radioactive elements and chemicals that are uh, the result of fracking. So as hydrofracking spreads, dealing with wastewater is a growing problem, and it's something that people don't often talk about. After concerns about water, the second biggest concern is about air pollution. Uh, natural gas is largely made of methane, CH4, uh, and that methane has a global warming potential 72 times higher than CO2 over a 20-year period. Natural gas operations are the leading source of methane leaks in the United States. The most dogged critic of methane emissions is a Cornell professor named Robert Howarth, who says that 3.6 to 7.9% of the methane from a fracked well escapes into the atmosphere. If he's right, that's a lot, 3.6 to 7.9%. If he's right, that means that natural gas from fracking is actually dirtier than coal and oil. And this challenge is one of the main selling points of fracking, and that is that gas is cleaner than 
uh, fossil fuels, other fossil fuels. But Hoar's study has been heavily criticized by the industry, and even one of his own Cornell colleagues called it seriously flawed. On the other hand, there's a new study out by the University of Texas that says that methane leakage is much less than that. It's less than 1%. So if that's true, that will also be big news. Uh, and to make sure, they're going to do 15 follow-up studies to that, to that test. And both the Environmental Defense Fund and energy companies are backing those studies because if methane leakage really is below 1%, that means that hydrofrac gas really is cleaner than coal and oil, and that's a big deal. Professor Howarth says that he's still skeptical of this, but uh, even he would worry much less if that is the case. So these are the basics of the hydrofracking fight. Uh, I've got more detail in the book if you're interested. But it makes me wonder, can the gap between the pro and anti-frackers ever be bridged? If you'd asked me this question in 2009 at that meeting and after speaking with some of those people dressed as mountains or, or talking about how they should have the right to drill their land, I would have said no, no way. Um, but you know, a lot has changed in the last four years. And uh, I have, uh, I'm cautiously optimistic. You know, some people in the industry have realized that they need to be more open and to communicate better about what it is they're doing. In 2011, uh, frackfocus.org, a national registry to which drillers can post their fracking chemicals, was launched. And in fact, the list of 55 chemicals I have in the book comes from frackfocus.org. This year, the IEA, the International Energy Agency, which is a pro-fracking consortium based in Paris, France, suggested steps that would cost the industry little and mollify critics. And they include reduce spills, monitor methane leaks, prevent wells from exploding, and other common sense steps. For their part, state regulators and some environmentalists seem willing to compromise a bit on their side. Uh, I was just in Chicago yesterday, and in Illinois, uh, they've had a very difficult debate about fracking. They just greenlit fracking earlier this year, but with the strictest regulations in the nation. Um, and while fracking remains highly controversial there, um, they may be providing a model for the rest of the country. The other thing that's happening right now, which is out of sight, is a great deal of research and technical innovation behind the scenes. Where some see risk, others see opportunity. So there's a legion of academics and researchers and venture capitalists who are betting that new technology will allow them to do well by doing good. Uh, I discuss some of these initiatives in the book, but uh, a couple that I'm particularly intrigued by include uh, using gelled propane to frack instead of water, and using ozone or electricity to clean up the wastewater. And we can talk about this later if you'd like, but uh, there's a lot of fascinating stuff that's kind of just over the horizon. On the regulatory side, effective oversight requires better data. Now, the EPA uh, has really waffled on fracking. Uh, a few years ago, they came out with some very strong uh, studies saying that fracking caused pollution, and then they seemed to back off from those uh, conclusions, pardon me, and now they're working with industry to create a series of best practices. But they say that fracking is a real priority. And next year, uh, EPA will impose uh, a new set of air pollution laws on frackers, and they've undertaken the first major national study of hydrofracking and its effect on water. And they're looking at 25,000 wells across the country. This study is going to be crucial for both sides. Uh, the early results will be coming out next year, and the final results will be coming out in 2016, which coincidentally or not happens to be President Obama's last full year in office. So all of this to me is a sign of the slow but steady maturing of the hydrofracking industry. So to return to the question posed by the woman I met in New York four years ago, is hydrofracking good or bad? Well, the answer is yes. <laughs> in other words, it's not all good and it's not all bad. It's a complex equation that's rendered in shades of gray. And that's not really surprising when you look at the history of energy development. From the days of burning wood and whale oil to the development of coal, oil, gas, and nuclear power, there's always been a give and take between uh, the demand for energy and uh, concerns about the environment and health. 
And so it is today. We have a rising demand for energy, and yet we're very well aware uh, uh, of the impacts of global warming. Uh, so how do we continue to grow and prosper without frying ourselves off the planet? I'm not sure that shale energy is the silver bullet, you know, the magical answer to all of our problems, but I am willing to admit that it's part of the answer. And we'll know a lot more in the next couple years as uh, all this innovation and um, research comes to light. I think hydrofracking is right now, it's in its adolescence. It's growing quickly in sometimes ungainly ways, and it presents us with a dilemma, as adolescents are wont to do. And the dilemma is this, while shale energy is too important to ignore, its health and environmental impacts are too significant to overlook. So the challenge is to learn how to produce the same amount of energy in a cleaner, safer way. The next energy revolution will be in renewables from the sun, wind, water, and geothermal heat. And we have the technology to use that. It is scalable. According to the IEA, solar could provide most of the world's electricity within 50 years. But we all know that reducing uh, carbon fuels is as much about political uh, and economic questions as it is about engineering questions. So to be a successful bridge fuel, shale gas must remain cheap enough to marginalize coal, but not so cheap that it undermines wind and solar. And that's a very tricky balance. Right now, gas is so cheap that it's actually undermining research in renewables. Uh, and it may require artificial incentives or penalties to force us to make the leap into the renewables. So, to conclude, where do I come out on hydrofracking now in 2013? And the short answer is that my position has grown a lot more nuanced uh, than it was four years ago. I have somewhat reluctantly concluded that the gas genie has now out of the bottle, and for better or worse, fracking is here to stay. There's simply too much oil and gas and money in play uh, for it to go away anytime soon. Gas, I believe, does burn cleaner than coal, and fracking could provide a long-term su supply of relatively clean fuel that will help us to transition to more sustainable sources. But if it's used irresponsibly, does not replace dirty fossil fuels, and undermines renewables, then the shale gale will be judged a failure. Make no mistake, this is a critical question, and the rest of the world is watching how we handle it. With great opportunity comes great responsibility. How will we respond? I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. All right, we have some time for questions. If you'll raise your hand, and then we will get the microphone to you. Rob, here, hold on, wait for the, wait for the mic, Rob. There it comes. Hello, uh, thank you for your, your work. I think it's important work that you're doing. Um, some kids in Arkansas, their graduate students made a film called The Natural State of America, and it was about the unique geological uh, formations in Arkansas, and we have a thing called karst here, which really is nowhere else like it is here and it allows surface spills to get to groundwater incredibly fast. And I wondered if there's anything in the book that co contrasts how the Haynesville shell might be different than the Barnett shell, might be different than the Marcel shell to the Fayetteville shell regarding the unique geology of certain areas. Great question. Um, as I said, I'm not a geologist. <laughs> I'm a generalist. Um, I do address that a little bit, but this is a book for the general public, the layperson, so I don't get into it too much. But one of the things I did include in the book is a whole list of resources for those who are interested in, in delving into a specific su subject like this uh, for you to reference. These are both online resources and printed material and so on. Um, there's a lot of information out there and uh, I just try to make it easy to access because uh, you can spend a lot of time looking around for it. I know about Karst because there's a lot of it in Wisconsin. And uh, when I was writing my water book, um, I discovered that, you know, they have these big CAFO farms there, uh, combined animal feedlot operations, which are giant farms. And they produce so much manure 
Uh, and there's so much karst that makes it, that is very porous, that uh, the manure is now getting into the drinking supplies of lots of people and making kids sick and, and uh, you know, destroying wells. And um, this is the kind of thing that's happening in various ways across the country, you know, whether it's from uh, energy exploration or giant CAFO farms. And, um, you know, again, uh, it's, it's a question of us being aware of the environmental impacts of the things that we do and making a judgment as a society about the cost uh, versus the benefits. And uh, it's not an easy question. Um, I'd love to see the film. Uh, what's it called? The Natural State of America. Natural State of America. OK. Is that online? Uh, you can buy the DVD. I don't know if they actually have it okay. streaming. It's streamed maybe in some places. But it's a real small budget film, but really well made. Excellent. Well, I'm not surprised. I didn't know about that. But uh, the thing that I've read about in the general press uh, about your state uh, is uh, this series of earthquakes that you've had here. Um, and I've seen pictures of people's uh, kitchen floors cracked or their stone wall broken. Um, I've been reading about there's a whole series of lawsuits happening now. Uh, I believe that um, none of them have actually gone to trial. Um, but there's certainly more than a handful. There's quite a lot of them. Um, and there were, I don't know, 40 or 50 tremors that I read about, uh, maybe more. Um, and I believe that um, there may be some new legislation that will be coming out next year in Arkansas. But um, I'd be curious to hear... I'd be curious to hear, uh, there's a fracker right now. <laughs> if anybody has experienced that here, I'd love to hear the story about it, because uh, it's foreign to me. As, Anybody here had their land fracked and had their kitchen floor cracked? Have you? Where do you live? Let's get, let's get, let me get the microphone. Can yeah. you go ahead? I'd love to hear this story, but yeah. we've got to keep it quick, but I'd love to hear the story. I'm doing a little reporting while I'm on your time here. <laughs> I live in Jacksonville, but we have a cabin and a farm at Rosebud, which is about probably 60 miles from here. And, uh, uh, we were in the house, and we happened to have some relatives from Seattle, Washington there, and so they knew exactly what it was when it mm. was happening, and that we heard noise through the fireplace, and uh, I looked out the window, and the livestock were just like prancing, you know, across the ground, and it split the grout and the tile all the way through the cabin and split all the way across a, an eight-foot porch. Holy cow. Well, thanks for sharing that. Wow. Interesting. Yeah, this is very real. We have one, we have one right here. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Emily Lane, a PhD in leadership a student at UCA. Um, I'm a, a filmmaker, and I, I really I liked your sentiment that you were you know, trying to be unbiased, and you're taking sort of a journalistic perspective. That's sort of what I do, too. I've actually just recently finished a film about the earthquakes that we had uh, in that area, because I live in that area, we had over 1,300. So it wasn't just 40 or 50, it was 1,300. It was quite a lot. Um, I was recently just taking some air samples a few days ago in the Fayetteville Shale and experienced nausea and headache and all kinds of, of ill uh, effects. Um, this certainly is a huge, huge issue, issue in this part of Arkansas, in this five county area, and it really is bigger than the five county area as well, because a lot of water and food and livestock comes from this area and goes to you all that live in Little Rock in these areas. So um, I would encourage any of you who want to know more about that. I have some fact sheets in my car and I should have brought them in, but um, I can hand out my business card or you can maybe come see the film, which is showing in Little Rock uh, the 22nd, two weeks from this Friday at Market Street Cinema, seven o'clock. Um, my name's Emily Lane. Our organization is ArkansasFracking.org. Uh, please get with me afterward if you'd like to talk about fracking specific in Arkansas, because we've been working very closely with this issue for a few years now. So, and okay. Thank you for okay. Being now, here. now, questions. We got. I understand. So let's leave it to questions. All right. Let's go right here at the back. I'll get you. just a minute, Judy. We'll get to you. Just, just relax. <laughs> okay. If fracking is here to stay, a regulation, effective regulation, is critical. Should that be at the federal level, the state level, if, if uh, at both, which, what are the advantages and disadvantages to each? Great question. Uh, as you may or may not know, there is no single set, national set of fracking laws right now. Um, fracking has become very politicized, as has the EPA. The EPA has lost a lot of its funding. 
uh, has been under attack. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, energy industry insists that uh, state regulations are sufficient to oversee fracking. But as I also mentioned, uh, some states have very minimal uh, regulation or none at all. And uh, it's kind of shocking because uh, I was just in California last week and one of the things I discovered there is that people, uh, they don't have any fracking regulations right now. They're scrambling. They, they caught, got caught flat-footed. And people started just going out and fracking without telling anybody or asking any permission. Uh, in fact, I was shocked to discover that they're actually fracking offshore uh, in the channel off of Santa Barbara, uh, where Julia Child lived, so I'm very familiar with that coast. Uh, people just took an old barge out there and uh, accessed some of the oiled oil wells that caused a huge uh, oil spill back in the late 60s, and uh, they started fracking. Uh, and the state regulators uh, suddenly jumped to it and are now quickly trying to write some laws. And there is a strong environmental movement in California, but even they were unaware of the fact that there's fracking going on all over the place. And that night I was in San Francisco talking about this. Uh, there happened to be an EPA guy there, and he got up and he said, you know, I work in a small office. We've lost a bunch of our people because of the budget cuts. And the guy two cubicles down from me is the one who's writing the fracking laws. One guy in a cubicle. And he is scrambling. He's going as fast as he can. So that's the reality of the regulation right now, uh, if you go state by state. So uh, I guess from my perspective, um, there's no question that there ought to be uh, federal oversight of this. And there's no question uh, that uh, it ought to be the EPA. They're the logical agency. Um, you know, as I mentioned, there's a lot of hyperbole around this. I get annoyed when the energy industry says, you know, there's no proof that fracking has ever polluted water. Well, that's just nonsense. But it's equally untrue that some of my friends say, which is that fracking pollutes water every single time or most times. That's just not true either. Uh, statistically, if you look at the data, water pollution happens very infrequently with fracking. But it does happen. Um, and as we frack more in geologically sensitive areas, the potential for chemicals to migrate underground is high. And, you know, groundwater supplies are very precious and uh, they're very difficult to clean up. Uh, it's important to know that, that the shale layer is, is often very far below uh, most groundwater supplies. But like I said, once you frack the rock, you can't unfrack it. And uh, there's no knowing uh, how that, that those chemicals uh, migrate. One of the new technologies that I talk about in the book is um, the development of something called tracers, where you can put a, a tracer, a chemical tracer, in, in the bottom of the well and you can see where it goes. And this is uh, brand new stuff. It's really interesting. Uh, there are a bunch of PhD students who are kind of idealistic and they think that they can, uh, they can change the world with the tracers, and they may be right. It's, a, it's really fascinating stuff. Um, I think, you know, we're at a very dynamic moment in the industry um, with all this innovation happening behind the scenes and, and people not in it simply for profit, but because it's become a big phenomenon and it's going global. Um, it's really important that we, um, that we uh, support that. The other thing, to your point, is that uh, it's up to us citizens, it's up to all of us, really. Uh, to ensure that those regulations get written and enforced. Um, there's a, a, a series of initiatives, citizens initiatives, uh, uh, around fracking right now. Everything from collecting data and crunching it, you know, this big data thing you keep hearing about. Um, if you can get a zillion little data points about where the well is and, and uh, what, what chemicals they're using and uh, how much uh, methane is getting into the air, uh, how many trucks are running wastewater, and you, you coalesce all that data, it can produce a very um, interesting uh, portrait of a, a fracking operation. And this is something that citizens can participate in. Um, you can also use your wallet and your vote and your voice. Um, and so, you know, get out there and support the EPA. Okay, Judy, here's the... <coughs> oh, wait a let me get the mic to you, hold on. Right up here, right here. Two questions for you. Uh, has, have there been studies done on how the health of the workers that are doing the fracking, how that has their health been in, in uh, influence. And secondly, I just was reading today that the Coast Guard is suggesting 
that they're going to allow barges to carry the wastewater, particularly up in Pennsylvania. And I wonder, I mean, that to you got me any more just, bad news for us? <laughs> sorry about that. that. That just sounds incredible because that gets in. I hadn't heard that. Um, well, to your first point, have there been studies on the workers? Not that have been made public. Um, there have been, there's, this is where the EPA has gotten itself tangled up because a few years ago they did some studies where they concluded that um, fracking operations in a number of states, particularly in Pennsylvania and in California, uh, had led to um, uh, people getting sick. And there was a famous case of a woman whose well exploded in her, she had a tumor, uh, a terrible tumor, but then she signed a non-disclosure agreement with the oil company, the gas company, and uh, uh, so she stopped talking. So there's, a, there's anecdotal evidence of uh, impact, on, fracking's impact on human health and also on animal health. Uh, you hear stories of uh, stillborn calves and, you know, dogs getting tumors and, you know, kind of horrible stuff. And um, if they can conclusively tie that to fracking, I think that would have a big impact. Uh, this is one of the things that the EPA is looking at. Um, and it's something that, uh, again, that we citizens, you need to give voice to it. Um, um, because the reality is that the, the, the industry's in it for a profit and the regulators uh, have their hands tied to a certain extent. Uh, but they will listen to the public. Uh, and so it's very important for all of us to pay attention to this stuff. And, and like I said, to have an informed debate, have an informed discussion and look at both sides, uh, but to really understand what we're talking about. As for the Coast Guard running, uh, giving the okay to run barges of, of wastewater, uh, I, that's crazy. <laughs> uh, that doesn't make any sense to me. Um, you know, it's one of those things, it sounds like a great idea, it'll be more efficient, you can move more, blah, 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 and then the first one that goes over and sinks, well, you know, you hear about barges hitting bridges, you hear about uh, barges running up on, on uh, sandbars, you hear about uh, storms. Um, uh, anybody who spent any time on boats know that um, it's a tricky proposition at best, and so, uh, to, to put um, highly uh, polluted and indeed toxic wastewater on a barge seems uh, nonsensical to me. Yes, we got a question right back here. I'm at the end of my PhD process in the scientific merit review process, yes. But what I'm wondering is if you have found any correlation as you've traveled between the insurance industry and the rates that homeowners are paying and what's happening to those rates and the areas where fracking is going on. Very interesting area. Um, you know, I started looking into that when I was doing my book and it got to be so inside baseball that I kind of steered clear of it. But I know from my reading, and I encourage you all to look, up, look this up because it's online, Yes, uh, the insurance industry is watching this very carefully. And as uh, I mentioned, I have some friends in New York who are very concerned about the real estate values of their upstate country homes because uh, there's fracking all around there and the insurance companies aren't so sure they want to uh, continue insuring them uh, because the, the danger is high. Um, and uh, I know for sure in a place like Dimmick, Pennsylvania, which is sort of, this is where Gasland, the movie, took place um, largely, uh, where they've had exploding wells and methane leaks and, and, um, and, and people with health issues, uh, the real estate value there has plummeted, as you can imagine. Same thing anecdotally in North Dakota around the back Bakken Shale. This gets to kind of a larger point that, that I'm interested in, which is the social impact of fracking. Uh, it's something that people don't talk about much, but, but they're beginning to now. So imagine you're a small town in South Dakota, or North Dakota. Uh, you've been scraping out a living on the prairie there, and suddenly a guy comes along and offers you, uh, you know, $6,000 an acre with a 20% royalty to, uh, to do a little exploratory drilling on your property. And you say, great, sure, come on in. I could make, uh, you know, I could make good money with that. Uh, next thing you know, the circus comes to town, right? Uh, over a thousand people show up. Giant uh, drill rigs, huge pumps, uh, big, you know, um, 
wastewater pits are dug. Uh, there's hoses everywhere. The wastewater trucks are running 24-7. They're ripping up your roads. There's traffic accidents. You can't find a hotel room for 100 miles. There's nothing left on the stores of the grocery, uh, the, the shelves of the grocery store. Uh, you go to the local bar, there's 500 guys for every one woman. Uh, and each one of those guys has a lot of money in his pocket. <laughs> What does that remind you of? Reminds me of the gold rush, right? It's a little crazy. It's a little kind of wild west. And this is what's happening. This is happening all across the country. Um, there was a great priest in, in National Geographic earlier this year talking about the Bakken Shale and, and the impact there. And, and there's, uh, there's more stuff coming out. And sociologists are beginning to study this. Because what happens is the circus comes to town. They do their thing. They frack the well. Uh, they get the gas flowing. And then they have... Um, uh, a compressor station and some storage tanks, and, and then, then the circus leaves and they go on to the next site. And they leave a few guys to kind of keep an eye on the operation. But suddenly, you have this hangover, right? There's a big silence uh, where there was all this cacophony. And, um, and there's a real um, kind of uh, negative social impact that comes along with all of this. Uh, sure, some people make money, but what if you're the, well, you know, you got two ranchers next to each other, okay? One guy, uh, he, uh, he has a gusher on his property and the guy next to him has nothing. Well, that's going to cause tension, right? Uh, there's a lot of um, aspects to this that uh, aren't as obvious as they might seem, but they're really interesting. So if there's any young journalists uh, or sociologists out there that are looking for something to do, I think this is a really uh, a cool area to look into. I know there are a lot of questions, but we also have people that want to get this book signed. Uh, and so I would encourage you that if you do have questions, come over and talk to Alex as he signs books. Let's give Alex a round of applause. Thanks so much. Appreciate it.